Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are such a generous giver that uh, our words cannot even express the gift. It can't even express our gratitude. Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see how we can live into that, how we can live into your grace, how we can live into the gift of your Son through the power of your gospel and Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would be present. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Has anyone received a lavish gift? Something that surprised you or shocked you? Or maybe you've given a lavish gift, something that you thought would surprise the receiver or shock them with your generosity, with your thoughtfulness, with your skill in knowing just the right thing to give. I did a little Google searching uh, this week about lavish gifts, and a few of them came up to the top of the list, so I'll, I'll share a few of those. The first is a gift from the World Wildlife Fund. You can symbolically adopt an elephant for $50. Uh, the next one, maybe some of us have done this one, is from Harry and David, the uh, fruit basket company. You can get some Moose Munch premium popcorn for only $64.99. And this one took the cake. This is from ababy.com, whose tagline is, a smart choice for proud parents. And you can get a diamond-encrusted pacifier for your infant. <laughs> 14 carat white gold with 278 diamonds, totaling three carats for a mere $17,000. <laughs> now, perhaps you have not given such a lavish gift, but as Christians, we are recipients of a gift much more lavish and much more generous. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. You may be a little uh, overwhelmed. The last three weeks, we've been talking about giving. Romans, or Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are Paul's uh, exhortation to the Corinthians to give and give generously. And so we've been spending time on that for the last few weeks. But this week we see the culmination. We see the point that Paul is getting at. Why we give generously is because we have received a lavish gift from God. And so we look at this passage. I want to look at uh, 2 Corinthians 9.15. So we're beginning at the end. And our ESV translation says, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Now, Eugene Peterson in the message communicates this in a really uh, great way, I think. He says, thank God for this gift, his gift. No language can praise it enough. And this is what we've received. We've received from Christ. And, but the question is, what is this gift? Paul is really concerned about the Corinthians knowing what's going on, knowing why they should give generously. And he uses a lot of examples. He says, first, uh, the Macedonians, they gave generously, and they gave out of their lack. They weren't very wealthy. Now, the Macedonians, you may know them better as uh, the church in Thessalonica, the letter to the Thessalonians. This is a city. Macedonia is the province. Uh, Thessalonica is the city in that province. And then we also see the province of Achaia. And this is also the province where the Corinth, the city of Corinth is at. And so Paul is talking about the broader communities, the broader church communities. We recognize them a little more uh, readily as the locations, the cities of Thessalonica and Corinth. Um, and so he's, what he's talking about is not the money that they're giving. What he's talking about is the gift they've received from Christ. The Scottish author and poet George MacDonald, he shed some light on what Paul is trying to get at. He says, for the real gift, good of every gift, it is essential first that the giver be in the gift, and next that the receiver know and receive the giver in the gift. Every gift of God is but a harbinger of his greatest and only sufficing gift, that of himself. And this is the heart of our gospel, that we have received the gift of Christ and that we get to share that with others, and because of that we can live generously. But this leads us into the problem, the problem that we face in 21st century America in an election season, in a quarantine, in a shutdown, in turmoil. It's easy to think that giving our money and time is we do it out of a sense of duty or obligation, that we do it because we ought to do it. Or on the positive side, we do it out of altruism. This is the right thing to do. Maybe I've been giving my whole life 
and whether I give to a church or to a nonprofit or some other place, that we do it because it's the right thing to do for the civic good. It's also easy for us to think of our giving as a power play. Maybe you've given a gift to someone that you knew would get a response, that you knew would put them in your debt. In each case, the gift is more like an exchange. It's, we're giving something, but we have expectations attached. And when we do that, we're not giving ourselves in a way that is similar or modeled after the gift of Christ. Maybe we give ourselves, or we give our money, but we don't give ourselves. Maybe we use giving as a way of alleviating guilt that we give because we feel like somehow that will justify or, or make us uh, less sinful or make us less guilty before God. But sometimes we use give, uh, give, giving as a way of justifying uh, sinning. That we think, oh, I can do this because I have given. That we think there's an exchange that's going on. And when we do this, we miss what Paul is talking about. And sometimes, as I said, we put expectations on others when we give. We give, but we give with, we have a saying for this, with strings attached, right? So we give with strings attached. It's an idiom. It's an axiom. It's something that we say because it happens so often. And this is not the kind of gift that Paul is asking for. But we also do this with God. Sometimes we give to God and we think that he owes us. We've given up a career for him. We've given up our money. We've given up our time, our energy, our emotions for him. And we feel a sense of obligation that now God owes us. He owes us health. He owes us wealth. He owes us happiness. He owes us our children's faith. He owes us because we have given. And this is not the economy of the gospel. This is bad news. It's bad news to think that when we give, we get. Because that's not how the gospel works. So when we give out of obligation or altruism even, or a power play, we tend to miss the opportunity for discipleship. And this is what Paul is trying to get at with the Corinthians. And this is where the good news of this passage comes in. The good news is that God is a generous and trustworthy giver. And so we can be also. When our generosity flows from his, we are able to give lavishly, to give cheerfully, and to give justly in a way that mimics what Christ has given us. Now, a little side note on giving justly. When the Bible talks about justice, it's talking about redemption or justice for the poor and the marginalized. It's talking about caring for those who have been exploited. And so when we give justly, we'll see this connection in our passage in a few minutes. So this will lead us into our, our passage uh, in 2 Corinthians. And before we dive in, it's important to think about or understand a little bit about the context that Paul is writing into, the context of first century Corinth. Now, there's a few things that Corinth it operates, the first century operates in what we call an honor-shame society. And this is a society that lives on gift exchange, that lives on obligation to one another based on what you've give, given to someone else. And so I want to highlight three areas of an honor-shame and a patronage culture that uh, Corinth is living in, that they're operating in, and how Paul contrasts with that. And so the first one is a sense of obligation, that you give to support the common good. You give out of, if you have money to give, you give to support what else is going on. So we see inscriptions where people have donated fountains for the city. Now, if you live in a city in the first century world, a fountain would be the only way you would get clean water. And so this was a really powerful, uh, a powerful gift for the giver to put their name front and center in the city. They paid for public feasts and celebrations and festivals. Now, if you're living in the first century world, probably one of the only ways you would get meat is at a public festival where someone else has provided the animal, someone who has money, and you could actually participate in that for free. This would be a huge honor. This, there's a Greek word that we use for this, or that the ancient people use, it's called liturgia. Now, you may be familiar that, from that word because we get our English word liturgy from that. 
And this is a public service. It's a public good. Liturgia just means something that's given for the greater good. And you can see the connection between our modern day concept of liturgy as well, of a public service. And so we have a concept of obligation. You give to serve the public. And Paul is speaking into this concept. And then the next concept that we have, so first we have obligation, the next we have is reciprocity. So this is giving to get. And this is, uh, they, one of the things that we talked about just a minute ago was gifts with strings attached. And so this could be public recognition. I'm going to make this gift, but you need to put my name on this building. Or I'm going to make this gift, but I need to have a seat on the city council. Or I'm going to make this gift, and uh, you need to put my name on the temple to the deity that I'm making an offering for. And so this exchange of a gift, that I'll do something for you if you do something for me. And we call this uh, a client relationship. That there's a, there's a system, there's a power that's at stake. And this leads us to the last way that giving happened in the ancient world. And this is through patronage. And this is, again, this power relationship stretched to the limit. Now, if you're living in the first century world, there's no bank that you can put your money in. There's no social support network. There's no health care. So when you were in trouble, you had to rely on someone who was wealthier than you to pay for your medical expenses to help you get some money so that you could pay for food if you needed it or to get a loan. And then, then you were in that person's debt. And they had power over you to call in that favor anytime they wanted. 97%, scholars estimate, of the ancient world lived at subsistence or below. And what this means is that 97% of the population was just making it by they had enough food for today, but wasn't sure about, they weren't sure about tomorrow. And so that means they were always relying on these wealthy patrons. And there are a few of those people in the Corinthian community that we know about. And so we have this model of obligation for giving, reciprocity, I give so I can get, and power, I give to have power. And Paul turned this on its head. Paul recalibrates this system and he reframes it around the gift that God has given. Now, Paul, if you, some of you may not know, Paul's primary goal or pri one of his primary obligations in, the, in uh, his ministry was collecting money for the Jerusalem church. Paul was the first century fundraiser premier. We hear about it in Romans 15. We hear about it in Galatians. We hear about it in 1 Corinthians 15. We hear about it in our passage, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. We also hear about in Acts 15 that he's actually commissioned by the apostles to collect money. And that's, why he, that's what is the impetus that sends him out on his missionary journeys. And so this was a central piece of Paul's mission and a central piece of how he understood the Corinthian believers or believers in general, their relationship to the gospel. And so he collected funds from three regions we know of, Galatia, which we've already seen in Thessalonica, and Corinth, these three areas. And he sent the letter to Romans. If you read Romans 15, you see that there's a little bit of, there's a, uh, a fundraising letter there at the end. I'm coming because I want to raise some support from you all, and I hope you can support me on my way to Spain. Um, and so he does this in order to fulfill this promise to the Jerusalem leadership. We see this in Galatians. And he does it to help the poor and the suffering in Jerusalem, to provide money for those uh, Jerusalem saints who are impoverished. So how does this help him break the system of patronage that I just mentioned? This obligation, this reciprocity, and this patronage. First, he is not looking for, to be a client. He's not looking to collect money so that he can be under their support. He's looking to collect money so he can be a conduit for what God has called him to do. He's looking to gather funds so that he can be the messenger of the good news to the Jerusalem church that he can bring God's grace, God's gift to them. And then second, he's asking the Corinthians to give out of their abundance, to live and to act as if Christ is central, as if that gift that Christ gave was the one that guides everything else. And then third, he asked that uh, Christ's gift, this gift, um, or he asked them to look at Christ's gift as the gift that guides their giving. And so this is the thing that should be motivating them. Not their own obligation, not their own sense of entitlement, not their own claims to power, but that Christ's gift is the one that motivates them. Now, if hearing all this about Christ's gift, 
it should remind us of a word central to our Christianity, the word grace. And this is because the word grace appears 10 times in this section in chapters 8 and 9. And it appears, if you read your English translation, you don't see the word grace appear that many times. You may see the word thanksgiving. You see abundant gift. And this is because that word grace that is in the single word in the Greek is translated in a couple different ways because it has different meanings because it, it takes a different context. But we understand that as grace. This is a free gift. And this is what Paul is encouraging his community to think about. He's connecting the gift that they give, the money that they give, to the gift of God. So when we turn to our passage in verses 1 through 5, what is Paul asking? His basic ask is, don't embarrass me. Right? He says, uh, I've told everyone that you guys have lots of money that you've collected it and you're planning on giving it. And uh, if I show up and that hasn't happened, I'm going to be in trouble. And what it, what's the movie makes after that? He says, not only am I going to be in trouble, but we're going to be in trouble together. We're all going to be embarrassed. So make sure that you've gathered the funds that I've told everyone that you have, have set apart. And so uh, they will be honored and shamed together in their gift, both Paul and the Corinthians. And so his practical point in verses 1 through 5 is be prepared for a collection. Be prepared because I'm going to come and I'm going to ask you about it. It should be there. And then he tells us the heart of the passage. He actually says it. The point is this, right? Whenever Paul says the point is this, we should probably stop and pay attention because he's explaining both what happened before and what he's going to get into. And he says that the gift they should be giving should be bountiful. And I've used this word lavish. This gift that is beyond expectations. Now, the verse, uh, verse 6 says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This isn't about give so I get. Paul's not inviting us into that exchange economy. What he's doing is he's inviting us into an economy of exponential growth. That when you sow bountifully, the return will be bountiful so that you have an abundance to give even more. Mm -hmm. That in the ancient world, if you had an abundance of crop uh, and you lived in a community like the Corinthian, Corinthian, the Corinthian church community, you would take that abundance and you would spread it among the community. You would give it to those in need. You would give it to the poor. And so the abundance that you face, the lavishness that you're able to give comes out of your own bountiful and lavish giving. When the return is bountiful, our future giving can be bountiful. And then what does Paul say? He says, give generously, right? So this is what the heart of that is in 9.6. Give generously. And then in 9.7, he says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so this is the second part. Paul says, give cheerfully. And then third in verse 9, he says, uh, as it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given, this is God who has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. And this is the sense of giving justly, giving so that righteousness may be proclaimed. And each of these have connections to an Old Testament passage uh, the first two from Proverbs and the second one from the Psalms, this quote from the Psalms, where Paul is turning the Corinthians' eyes back to Scripture to see how and why they should give and away from their culture. They're looking back to Scripture. They're not to give out of obligation or reciprocity or patronage. They're to give lavishly. They're to give cheerfully. And they're to give justly. And this giving causes others to glorify God and to have their own thanksgiving. And this is the heart of that inexpressible gift. And this leads us into verses 12 through 15. So what's going on here? What's, Paul gives us a little bit of the logic behind his request in these verses. And this is actually is where that word liturgia shows up again, that word, that service, that public service. And this is uh, in verse um, 13. The approval of their service, they will glorify God because of your submission. And so this gift comes out of a new framework. It comes out of an obligation not to uh, another group or not to uh, give money, but an obligation to God. 
that it's an obligation for his inexpressible gift. One commentator says, generous giving to the saints is not only a civic obligation, but it's an act of worship and thanksgiving to God. That it's something that draws the community in, and by their thanksgiving, they are inspiring others. Another commentator says, generosity is an act both of service and worship, the care of those in need and the cause of thanksgiving to God, and it extends beyond the community of disciples. It's actually a proclamation of the gospel when we give generously, cheerfully, and justly. And so what does this do? What does this gift do for the Corinthians? First, it lets them express their gratitude for the spiritual debt that they owed to the Jerusalem believers. That the community in Corinth was under an obligation to the Jewish church because of the proclamation of the gospel. And they were able to express their gratitude for that. And then second, it unifies them with the Jerusalem Christians. When they give, just like we give to Rwanda, when we do that, it's an act of Christian unity. It brings us together into the common body of Christ in a way that little other things can. And next, it creates a sense of connection between the Christian communities across the globe. And so when Paul exhorts the uh, Corinthians to give because the Thessalonians have given, it binds them together. It unifies the body in a way that brings them into one in Christ. And then it inspires gratitude towards God in the Jerusalem church and in the church in Corinth. And so if you've ever received a lavish gift, that gratitude wells up. And if you know that gift has come on behalf of Christ or because of uh, Christ, that gratitude is pointed towards God. When we receive those gifts, we can't help but be thankful. So what does this mean for us today? When we give generously, our desires begin to change. One example, it's really hard to be generous when you're afraid. When you're afraid about the economy, you're afraid about your health, you're afraid about the state of our country. And when we are generous in the midst of that, God inspires in us, God's spirit works in us, and we are changed. Our desires are reoriented from ones that are embraced in fear of those unknowns to ones that are embraced in God's lavish gift. And Paul reminds us this through the Corinthians. And next, when we give cheerfully, we invite others into our thanks to God. We don't give cheerfully just so we can see the response in uh, the receiver's face. Now, if you're a grandparent and you've given a gift to your grandchild and you see that face, I've seen it in my own kids, their faces light up and then the grandparent's face lights up and there's such a beauty and a generosity in that. And that is what God has given us a thousandfold, a millionfold, that we have that joy that when we are able to give something cheerfully to one another, God's face shines and we're able to share that as well. And then when we give justly, we proclaim God's own righteousness. When we give in such a way of our finances, of our time, of our energy, of our emotions, to help promote justice, to help uh, support those who are marginalized on the borders, those who are poor, we actually are proclaiming God's own righteousness. We are saying with Paul and the psalmist that his righteousness endures forever. And so when we give in such a way that promotes justice, we are giving in such a way that promotes God's righteousness. Just as when we are leaning on Christ's salvation or Christ for our salvation, we are promoting God's righteousness. God is a generous and trustworthy giver so we can be also. When we give generously, cheerfully, and justly in Christ, we're basking in the light of the undeserved and unearned generosity of God. And we are shining that light into a dark world. That when we give, not just of our money, but of our time and of ourselves, that that gift has an impact. So what can we do this week to embrace this? First, ask God to show you his generosity. It's so easy to miss that in our daily life. It's so easy to wake up and see that there are no mountains once again and take for granted our ability to see the mountains nearly every day of the year. 
and to have a heart of ingratitude rather than turning towards God with a heart of gratitude. One way you could do that this week is in one of the prayers, the occasional prayers from the 2019 Book of Common Prayer. This is Prayer 92, Julian of Norwich. It says, O oh God, of your goodness give me yourself, for you are enough for me. I can ask for nothing less that is completely to your honor, and if I do ask anything less, I shall always be in want. Only in you I have all. So spend some time this week in that prayer. Next is act. Be generous, be cheerful, and be a just giver this week, fueled by God's generosity. The great theologian Brene Brown, she's not a theologian, for those who don't know, uh, said, we get from the head to the heart through the hands. So we get to the head through the heart, or we get to the head, get from the head to the heart through the hands. Give. Give generously. Give surprisingly. And then our last piece is remember the gift we've received. In a few moments, we're going to come to the Lord's table. The Eucharist. This is actually that word it means thanksgiving. And it appears in that last verse, those last few verses of this chapter. That we come in thanksgiving. We receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in a way that reminds us of God's gift. And this points us back to 2 Corinthians 8, 9 that we heard uh, two weeks ago. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And this is where Paul leaves us, that we come to the table knowing our own poverty, but also receiving the richness of Christ's gift. And it's because of that we can proclaim, thanks be to God, for his inexpressible gift. Amen.